exposed, naked and perishing, and in want of help from his fellow men. He passed on his way, persuading himself that it was none of his business, and that he had no need to trouble himself over the case, claiming to be an expositor of the law, to be a minister in sacred things, he yet passed on by the other side. Enshrined in the pillar of cloud, the Lord Jesus had given special direction in regard to the performance of acts of mercy toward men and beast. While the law of God requires supreme love to God and impartial love to our neighbors, its far-reaching requirements also take in the, num the dumb creatures that cannot express in words their wants or sufferings. Thou shalt not see thy brother's ass or any his ox fall down by the way, and hide thyself from them. Thou shalt surely help him to lift them up again. He who loves God not only will love his fellow men, but will regard with tender compassion the creatures which God has made. When the Spirit of God is in man, it leads him to relieve rather than to create suffering. Review and Herald, January 1, 1895. The principles of God's law were forgotten. The priest and Levite had no excuse for their cold-hearted difference. The law of mercy and kindness was plainly stated in the Old Testament scriptures. It was their appointed work to minister to just such cases as the one whom they had coldly passed by. Had they obeyed the law they claimed to respect, they would not have passed this man by without helping him but they had forgotten the principles of the law that Christ enshrouded in the pillar of cloud had given to their fathers as he had led them through the wilderness. Who is my neighbor? This is a question that all our churches need to understand. Had the priest and the Levite read understandingly the Hebrew code, their treatment of the wounded man would have been far different. Manuscript 117, 1903 conditions of inheriting eternal life. The conditions of inheriting eternal life are plainly stated by our Savior in the most simple manner. The man who was wounded and robbed represents those who are subjects of our interest, sympathy, and charity. If we neglect the cases of the needy and the unfortunate that are brought under our notice, no matter who they may be, we have no assurance of eternal life, for we do not answer the claims that God has upon us. We are not compassionate and pitiful to humanity, because they may not be kith or kin to us. You have been found transgressors of the second great commandment, upon which the last six commandments depend. Whosoever offendeth in one point is guilty of all. Those who do not open their hearts to the wants and sufferings of humanity will not open their hearts to the claims of God as stated in the first four precepts of the Decalogue. Idols claim the hearts and affections, and God is not honored and does not reign supreme. Testimony, Volume 3, page 524. Your Opportunity and Mine Today God gives men opportunity to show whether they love their fellow and their neighbor. He who truly loves God and his fellow man is he who shows mercy to the destitute, the suffering, the wounded, those who are ready to die. God calls upon every man to take up his neglected work, to seek to restore the moral image of the Creator in humanity. Letters 113-1901 How we may love our neighbors as ourselves We can love our neighbors as ourselves only as we love God supremely. The love of God will bear fruit in love to our neighbors. Many think that it is impossible to love our neighbor as ourselves but it is the only genuine fruit of Christianity. Love to others is putting on the Lord Jesus Christ. It is working and walking with the invisible world in view. We are thus to keep looking unto Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith. Review and Herald, June 26, 1894. Chapter 6, Our Example in Welfare Ministry Christ stands before us as the great pattern. Make Christ's work an example. Constantly he went about doing good, feeding the hungry and healing the sick. No one who came to him for sympathy was disappointed. 
the commander of the heavenly courts, he was made flesh and dwelt among us, and his life work is an example of the work we are to do. His tender, pitying love rebukes our selfishness and heartlessness. Manuscript 55, 1901 Christ stood at the head of humanity in the garb of humanity. So full of sympathy and love was his attitude that the poorest was not afraid to come to him. He was kind to all, easily approached by the most lowly. He went from house to house, healing the sick, feeding the hungry, comforting the mourners, soothing the afflicted, speaking peace to the distressed. He was willing to humble himself, to deny himself. He did not seek to distinguish himself. He was the servant of all. It was his meat and drink to be a comfort and a consolation to others, to gladden the sad and heavy-laden ones with whom he daily came in contact. Christ stands before us as a pattern man, the great medical missionary, an example for all who should come after. His love, pure and holy, blessed all who came within the sphere of its influence. His character is absolutely perfect, free from slightest stain of sin. He came as an expression of the perfect love of God, not to crush, not to judge and condemn, but to heal every weak, defective character, to save man and women from Satan's power. He is the creator, redeemer, and sustainer of the human race. He gives to all the invitation, Come unto me, all ye that labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you, and learn of me, for I am meek and lowly in heart, and ye shall find rest unto your souls. For my yoke is easy, and my burden is light. What then is the example that we are to set to the world? We are to do the same work that the great medical missionary undertook in our behalf. We are to follow the path of self-sacrifice trodden by Christ. Special Testimonies, Series B, Number 8, pages 32 and 33. Christ moved with compassion. When Christ saw the multitudes that gathered about him, he was moved with compassion on them because they fainted and were scattered abroad as sheep having no shepherd. Christ saw the sickness, the sorrow, the want and degradation of the multitudes that thronged his steps. To him were presented the needs and woes of humanity throughout the world. Among the high and low, the most honored and the most degraded, he beheld souls who were longing for the very blessings he had come to bring. Today the same need exists. The world is in need of workers who will labor as Christ did for the suffering and the sinful. There is indeed a multitude to be reached. The world is full of sickness, suffering, distress, and sin. It is full of those who need to be ministered unto, the weak, the helpless, the ignorant, the degraded. Testimonies, Volume 6, page 254. The model we should copy. The true missionary spirit is the spirit of Christ. The world's redeemer was the great model missionary. Many of his followers have labored earnestly and unselfishly in the cause of human salvation. But no man's labor can bear comparison with the self-denial and sacrifice, the benevolence of our exemplar. The love which Christ has evinced will, for us is without a parallel. How earnestly he labored! How often was he alone in fervent prayer, on the mountainside or in the retirement of the garden, pouring out his supplications with strong crying and tears! How perseveringly he urged his petitions in behalf of sinners! Even on the cross he forgot his own sufferings in his deep love for those whom he came to save. How cold our love, how feeble our interest, when compared with the love and interest manifested by our Savior. Jesus gave himself to redeem our race, and yet how ready are we to excuse ourselves from giving all that we have for Jesus. Our Savior submitted to wearing, wearing labor, ignominy, and suffering. He was repulsed, mocked, derided, while engaged in the great work which he came to earth to do. Do you, my brethren and sisters, inquire, 
What model shall we copy? I do not point you to great and good men, but to the world's Redeemer. If we would have the true missionary spirit, we must be imbued with the love of Christ. We must look to the author and finisher of our faith, study his ex character, cultivate his spirit of meekness and humility, and walk in his footsteps. Many suppose that the missionary spirit, the qualification for missionary work, is a special gift or endowment bestowed upon the ministers and a few members of the church, and that all others are to be mere spectators. Never was there a greater mistake. Every true Christian will possess a missionary spirit, for to be a Christian is to be Christ-like. No man liveth to himself, and if any man have not the Spirit of Christ, he is none of his. Everyone who has tasted of the powers of the world to come, whether he be young or old, learned or unlearned, will be stirred with the Spirit which actuated Christ. The very first, first impulse of the renewed heart is to bring others also to the Savior. Those who do not possess this desire give evidence that they have lost their first love. They should closely examine their own hearts in the light of God's Word and earnestly seek a fresh baptism of the Spirit of Christ. They should pray for a deeper comprehension of that wondrous love which Jesus manifested for us in leaving the realms of glory and coming to a fallen world to save the perishing. It is taken volume 5, pages 385, 386. Christ's Interpretation of the Gospel The Divine Commission needs no reform. Christ's way of presenting truth cannot be improved upon. The Savior gave the disciples practical lessons, teaching them how to work in such a way as to make souls glad in the truth. He sympathized with the weary, the heavy laden, the oppressed. He fed the hungry and healed the sick. Constantly he went about doing good, but the good he accomplished, by his loving words and kindly deeds, he interpreted the gospel to men. Brief as was the period of his public ministry, he accomplished the work he came to do. How impressive were the truths he taught! How complete his life work! What spiritual food he daily imparted as he presented the bread of life to thousands of hungry souls! His life was a living ministry of the word. He promised nothing that he did not perform. The words of life were presented in such a simplicity that a child could understand them. Men, women, and children were so impressed with his manner of explaining the scriptures that they would catch the very intonation of his voice, place the same emphasis on their words, and imitate his gestures. Youth caught his spirit of ministry and sought to pattern after his gracious ways by seeking to assist those who they saw needing help. Just as we trace the pathway of a stream of water by the line of living green it produces, so Christ could be seen in the deeds of mercy that marked his pathway at every step. Wherever he went, health sprang up, and happiness followed wherever he passed. The blind and deaf rejoiced in his presence. His words to the ignorant opened to them a fountain of life. He dispensed his blessings abundantly and continuously. They were the gardenered treasures of eternity, given in Christ, the Lord's rich gift to man. Christ's work in behalf of man is not finished. It continues today. In like manner, his ambassadors are to preach the gospel and to reveal his pitying love for lost and perishing souls. By an unselfish interest in those who need help, they are to give a practical demonstration of the truth of the gospel. Much more than mere sermonizing is included in this work. The evangelization of the world is the work of God that he has given to those who go forth in his name. They are to be co-laborers with Christ, revealing to those ready to perish his tender, pitying love. God calls for thousands to work for him, not by preaching to those who know the truth for this time, but by warning those who have never heard the last message of mercy work with a heart filled with an earnest longing for souls. Do medical missionary work. Thus you will gain access to the hearts of people 
and the way will be prepared for a more decided proclamation of the truth. Who are labors together with Christ in this blessed medical missionary work? Who have learned the lessons of the Master and know how to deal skillfully with souls for whom Christ hath died? We need, oh, so much, physicians for the soul who have been educated in the school of Christ and who can work in Christ's lines. Review and Herald, December 17, 1914. Chapter 7, Visitation, the New Testament Plan. Christ's Methods of Labor From Christ's methods of labor we may learn valuable lessons. He did not follow merely one method. In various ways he sought to gain the attention of the multitude, that he might proclaim to them the truths of the gospel. Christ's chief work was in ministering to the poor, the needy, and the ignorant. In simplicity he opened before them the blessings they might receive, and thus aroused a soul hunger for the bread of life. Christ's life is an example to all his followers. It is the duty of all who have learned the way of life to teach others what it means to believe in the word of God. There are many now in the shadow of death who need to be instructed in the truths of the gospel. Nearly the whole world is lying in wickedness, yet we have words of hope for those who sit in darkness. Review and Herald, May 9, 1912. The Scope of Christ's House-to-House -house Ministry our Savior went from house to house, healing the sick, comforting the mourners, soothing the afflicted, speaking peace to the disconsolate. He took the little children in his arms and blessed them, and spoke words of hope and comfort to the weary mothers. With unfailing tenderness and gentleness, he met every form of human woe and affliction. Not for himself, but for others did he labor. He was the servant of all. It was his meat and drink to bring hope and strength to with whom he came in contact. Gospel Workers, page 188. Christ's method brings true success. Christ's method alone will give true success in reaching the people. The Savior mingled with men as one who desired their good. He showed his sympathy for them, ministered to their needs, and won their confidence. Then he bade them, follow me. Ministry of Healing, page 143. This was the way the Christian church was established. Christ first selected a few persons and bade them follow him. Then they went in search of their relatives and acquaintances and brought them to Christ. This is the way we are to labor. A few souls brought out and fully established in the truth will, like the first disciples, be laborers for others. Review and Herald, December 8, 1885. The Divine Example of Personal Evangelism Jesus came in personal contact with men. He did not stand aloof and apart from those who needed his help. He entered the homes of men, comforted the mourner, healed the sick, aroused the careless, and went about doing good. And if we follow in the footsteps of Jesus, we must do as he did. We must give men the same kind of help that he gave. Review and Herald April 24, 1888. It is not preaching that is the most important. It is house-to-house -house work, reasoning from the Word, explaining the Word. It is those workers who follow the methods that Christ followed who will win souls for their hire. Gospel Workers, page 468. The Lord desires that His Word of grace shall be brought home to every soul. To a great degree, this must be accomplished by personal labor. This was Christ's method. His work was largely made up of personal interviews. He had a faithful regard for the one soul audience. Through that one soul, the message was often extended to thousands. Christ's Object Lessons, page 229. The Twelve Sent Forth in House to House Labor on this first tour, the disciples were to go only where Jesus had been before them and had made friends. Nothing must be allowed to divert their minds from their great work or in any way excite opposition and close the door for further labor. They were not to adopt the dress of the religious teachers, 
nor use any guise in apparel to distinguish them from the humble peasants. They were not to enter into the synagogues and call the people together for public service. Their efforts were to be put forth in house-to-house -house labor. They were to enter the dwelling with the beautiful salutation, Peace be to this house. That house would be blessed by their prayers, their songs of praise and the opening of the scriptures in the family circle. Desire of Ages, pages 351 and 352. The seventy likewise. Calling the twelve about him, Jesus bade them go out two and two throughout the towns and villages. None were sent alone, but brother were associated with brother, friend with friend. Thus they could help and encourage each other, counseling and praying together, each one's strength supplementing the other's weakness. In the same manner, he afterwards sent forth the seventy. It was the Savior's purpose that the messengers of the gospel should be associated in this way. In our own time, evangelistic work would be far more successful if this example were more closely followed. Desire of Ages, page 350. Paul went from house to house. Paul, as well as laboring publicly, went from house to house, preaching repentance toward God and faith toward our Lord Jesus Christ. He met with men at their homes and besought them with tears, declaring unto them the whole counsel of God. Review and Herald, April 24, 1888. The Secret of Paul's Power and Success On one occasion Paul said, Ye know from the first day that I came into Asia, after what manner I have been with you at all seasons, serving the Lord with all humility of mind, and with many tears, and temptations which befell me by the lying in wait of the Jews, and how I kept back nothing that was profitable unto you, but have showed you and have taught you publicly from house to house. These words explain the secret of Paul's power and success. He kept back nothing that was profitable for the people. He preached Christ publicly in the marketplaces and the synagogues. He taught from house to house, availing himself of the familiar intercourse of the home circle. He visited the sick and the sorrowing, comforting the afflicted and lifting up the oppressed. And in all that he said and did, he preached a crucified and risen Savior. Youth Instructor, November 22, 1900. Paul also found access to others through his trade. During the long period of his ministry in Ephesus, where for three years he carried forward an aggressive evangelistic effort throughout that region, Paul again worked at his trade. There were some who objected to Paul's toiling with his hands, declaring that it was inconsistent with the work of a gospel minister. Why should Paul, a minister of the highest rank, thus connect mechanical work with the preaching of the word? Was not the laborer worthy of his hire? Why should he spend his time in making tents, that to all appearances could be put to better account. But Paul did not regard as lost the time thus spent. As he worked with Aquila, he kept in touch with the great teacher, losing no opportunity of witnessing for the Savior and of helping those who needed help. His mind was ever reaching out for spiritual knowledge. He gave his fellow workers instruction in spiritual things. 